Welcome to With One Accord, the Houston Chamber Choir podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn, host of Behind the Music. Today's episode is made possible in part by the generous support of Silvercrest Asset Management Group, providing an unparalleled level of quality investment advice. It's a great pleasure this time to welcome to Behind the Music, Dr. Jason Thomes, who is, and this is a new word to me, an octavist. Jason, welcome. Thank you very much. The first thing I have to get you to do is to say what an octavist is. Well, that's a, it's a good question. And we've been hearing a lot about it, uh, much more about it in the last decade or so as more orthodox choral music has been kind of hitting the scene with different uh, recordings, hitting the Grammys uh, from a variety of different ensembles. And you start hearing more and more about octavists. And ultimately an octavist within a orthodox worship service or liturgy or, or choir would be a bass who would sing an octave lower than the other basses. So it's, it's sometimes common in, in just in four part choral singing in, in a orthodox liturgy, uh, the bass part's not necessarily very low, but uh, it's pretty common that a, a couple of few basses might sing part of it down an octave, or you might you might sing down an octave and then come back up based on what part of the bass line it's, or you know, where on the stave it lies. Uh, and in some cases, you may be singing everything down an octave. Uh, and it's, uh, when Rachmaninoff wrote the All Night Vigil, uh, the, the person that he wrote it for said, that having basses that could sing this was like having asparagus in winter. So uh, it was somewhat rare, but a delicacy at the same time. And you will be singing the uh, All Night Vigil with the Houston Chamber Choir uh, later in April. I want to talk uh, about the All Night Vigil itself um, because it's arguably Rachmaninoff's greatest work, certainly his, his greatest choral work. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the history of this piece. Well, I mean, this is a piece that was written um, a little over 100 years ago. We celebrated the 100th anniversary, I think it was in uh, 2015, I think somewhere around there. So Yes, I think so. And, and so everything kind of blew up around there. And in fact, that's in a lot of ways, uh, I started singing this piece only just a little bit before that. And then there was a lot of performances in 2015 and I ended up doing it a number of times uh, in, in that year and obviously in years since. Um, but it's, it's a, a piece that is, was written not necessarily to be performed in worship, but as a concert piece. And you know, every once in a while, you might find yourself in a situation where you do it somewhat liturgically where you add some of the chants in. There, there are places where in the piece it says amen before a movement starts. Um, I, I believe we're, we're eliminating those amens because we're not doing any of the, the liturgical chants before the different movements when the Houston Chamber Choir sings. Um, but I've done, in a, I've done in a few performances where we've added a bunch of, of the chants and things like that in there. And it's, it's just a, a very interesting piece, but it's much more of a concert piece than a liturgical piece that you would do in worship. You have to be required to do it in worship. Uh, you know, this is not a piece to be done with uh, 12 singers. Uh, it's, it's a piece that you, you need to have a, a little bit of a bulk of, of singers to do. So it's a bit like the, the Mozart Requiem, for example. It's, it's written for a, a particular uh, liturgical theme, if you like, but is not really written to be performed during a service. Right, right. And, and I think the virtuosicness of the Rachmaninoff Alt Night Vigil, um, you know, in some ways may even come across as negative within a worship service to, you know, have the choir stand out so much. But when you think about uh, Orthodox choral singing, Orthodox liturgy, one of the most important parts of the, every aspect of the Orthodox experience is beauty. The beauty of the icons, the beauty of the vestments, the beauty of the singing, uh, and that beauty uh, where as a Lutheran, as I grew up as a Lutheran, would maybe distract us from God, 
and the orthodox view that beauty draws us into God and so it's it's uh, uh, they're not afraid of beautiful things in the orthodox church uh, they're not afraid of extravagant things that that are, are there to uh, promote the the worship experience uh, but you, it depends on how you're approaching it if you're approaching it as an old an old Lutheran or as a, a new Orthodox, uh, those, you have different viewpoints there. Let's talk a little bit about the, the Russian liturgical choral tradition, because uh, you mentioned it and it is so, so central. Yeah, the same for the, uh, the, the Western Christian church as well. But this is a, a tradition that is very much based on a cappella singing, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, the Orthodox, Orthodox choral music primarily, unless you kind of coming from a, a Greek, some Greek traditions use organ, uh, Greek Orthodox traditions. Uh, but when we think about even Byzantine or Orthodox that uh, happens here in America, or is, you know, most of what we have in America is somewhat influenced by historic Russian Orthodoxy. And that's all, uh, you know, a, a cappella singing. Um, it, a lot of the times, when you, if you go sing within an Orthodox church, um, many of the singers in there have learned this from rote as uh, young singers. And so there's, there's certain mm -hmm. the worship service where you're, you're singing through uh, maybe a setting of a psalm or something like that. There's no notes at all. You just have to know what the tune is, which is really hard if you uh, read music and you, you don't just you know, make things up on the spot. And so I, you know, as I've sung in a lot of liturgical uh, Orthodox services, and it's super fun. I mean, the music is beautiful. I mean, I think I wrote an article for ACDA that came out uh, November, I think, of last year, trying to just introduce people a little bit to Orthodox choral music, because for me, uh, the amount of Orthodox choral music I've done in the last seven, eight years, um, I never learned a single thing about Orthodox choral music in graduate school, uh, or any of my educational experiences, even just to maybe mention the Rachmaninoff all night vigil, but we really never delved into any of it. And the amount of just simple, beautiful, four-part music that could work in any worship service, could even work in, in many concert settings, is, is as much as you would ever find in, in the Renaissance uh, you know, choral tradition. As much repertoire as there is there, there is in the Orthodox. Uh, liturgical uh, world uh, that's around today. So it's a pretty uh, beautiful, simple, gorgeous, and uh, also you have to be prepared to sing for a very long time in an Orthodox service. I would say probably the choir sings about 90% of the worship experience time. So if you're singing on a Pascha, which uh, Pascha is the Orthodox Easter, if you're singing for a Pascha service uh, in a place like St. Tikhon's in Pennsylvania, you might be singing for over four hours uh, in a four and a half hour long service. So, I mean, you're just going and going and going. And so the, when you look at the all night vigil and you say, wow, this is a 70 minute piece of music, it's so big. Uh, most Orthodox folks would say, well, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you're missing by just, <laughs> you know, there's, you've got a couple more hours of singing after that. And I should point out, you say ACDA, that's the American Choral Directors Association. Yeah, yeah, their choral journal. I, I had an article kind of inter introducing Orthodox music, but also a little bit comparing the Catholic mass that we would have all learned about in music history class with the Orthodox liturgy and kind of lining it up so folks would see uh, how a traditional Catholic mass and Orthodox liturgy line up and where some of the music that they might find in the Orthodox setting could actually work within other uh, Christian traditions in worship. The Rachmaninoff piece, uh, as you said, is I think 15 different movements. Um, the texts are all taken from the uh, Russian uh, liturgical uh, hours, aren't they? The, the sort of monastic hours of the day. Yeah, we have the Vespers. So a lot of times you little people talk about the Rachmaninoff Vespers, but the Vespers yes, is only the first half of the performance. The second right. is the Matins. So it's it's two two hour two different hours. One the last last hours of the of previous day, and the other one the first hours of the next day. Uh, and that's why when it comes down to 
something like Pasca, that service starts at 10.30 uh, on Saturday night and goes until three in the morning on Sunday. Uh, and so that it's going across those, those different hours. And that's kind of where you would maybe find that all night vigil happening in there. Let's talk also about the voices because um, there are female voices, aren't there? I mean, there's, this, this is a, a full choral setting that, mm -hmm. that has, goes from high, high sopranos all the way down to low basses. And uh, I think pretty much every voice part is at some point is split into three divisions of that voice part. So at some points you're, you're close to 12 parts, maybe singing at once, or at least you have groups of you know, be three sopranos, three tenors, while you have one alto and one bass. Um, but there's tons and tons in every voice part. Uh, you know, if you are a soprano one, you are singing from the extremes of your range up and down. If you're a soprano three, you have an equal challenge. Every, every voice part is challenged in this piece. There's, there's no part that gets to take a vacation. Uh, if, if you're singing the, the low octavist, the low bass three, part that, that I'll sing, there is a two and a half octave range in that from a low B flat that happens, I think, 11 times in that piece, all the way up to a high F. Uh, and of course, that's the fun part is when you see that, you know, that high F's coming, it's right after a page turn. You know, that high F is coming. You're like, I'm going to do it as a, you know, as a low bass, I'm going to sing the high F. And then a couple of measures later, I'm going to sing a low B flat. And you just feel good about yourself. So it's a challenge. It's a workout. I think that I was introduced to this piece, the All Night Vigil, through the Robert Shaw recording, the uh, the Robert Shaw Festival Singers, which I think came out in 1989. Just a, an absolute gorgeous performance right. uh, of of this piece. Um, it's it's so iconic. And what's interesting is that. Um, not only Rachmaninoff, but there are also other uh, Russian composers who, like Rimsky-Korsakov and, and Sergei Teneyev, who have, have taken and set uh, different liturgical pieces. And I'm also thinking of um, John Tavener, who uh, had a, a real uh, love for and was drawn to the, the Orthodox tradition in his own composing. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing that's interesting uh, about Orthodox, if we call it Russian Orthodox choral music, is there was a, a bit of a heyday that happened in the late 1800s. You know, there, there is a kind of a Baroque era in, in Russian uh, liturgical music. It was later than what we would consider the Baroque era would be in Western music. But they had all that. But when, by the time Rachmaninoff uh, writes the All Night Vigil and it's performed within what, a couple of years, or very, very shortly after that, uh, is the fall of the czar, and, mm. you know, right. the church is banned. And there is no liturgical Orthodox singing that happens in Russia for an extremely long time. And there's a number of composers, uh, I can't, the one name just slipped my mind as I was about to say it, but there was one composer, especially, who wrote just spectacularly beautiful music and he would just go put it in his drawer because it was never going to be performed in his lifetime. Uh, and so, you know, while we think of how great some of these music is, Rimsky-Korsakov, or we think of Tchaikovsky, or we think of some of these other uh, composers who wrote great stuff, we're talking about over 100 years ago. And so there was this huge gap until we get into close to modern times when the Orthodox Church uh, it is allowed to start doing what it's doing again, and we start to have uh, some singing happening uh, that 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 is a that, that is allowed to be happening. Um, and so it's there was a big gap in the middle of the 20th century where, uh, if any music was being written, it was not being performed; it was just being put away, uh, or it just wasn't being done. And so a lot of stuff that we think about as uh, the history of orthodoxy and, and stuff like that has actually was kind of percolating in America until about the time when that Shaw recording comes out. And around that time, a number of different places like St. Vlad's in Yonkers, New York, and, and St. Tikhon's in Pennsylvania were starting to try to create English versions of a lot of music. 
because the Orthodox tradition is historically kind of an ethnically based, uh, you, you're Ukrainian Orthodox, or you're Russian Orthodox, or you're Greek Orthodox, you know, so, and, and the, the services would be happening mostly in those languages, and only uh, around maybe the time of Vatican II and things like that, was there kind of starting to be a big push that even Orthodox stuff would be happening in English. You think about Lutherans, the same thing was happening. They were doing most stuff in German uh, and they started doing stuff in English and to get to the mid, mid 20th century. So it all kind of flows together, but there was a void for quite a while uh, in creation and singing of true Russian Orthodox singing because it was banned and not allowed to be uh, done in, in, in Russia. Obviously, Rachmaninoff uses Russian texts. What is it like to sing in Russian? Is it a is it a good language for choral music? I guess. Well, it, it, the interesting part is, I mean, this piece is in Church Slavonic, which is very very similar to Russian. There's a few different things in there, which I don't know that I could actually tell you the differences uh, precisely, but. Uh, officially, where anytime you think you sing in a liturgical Orthodox setting that's from Russia is in church Slavonic. It uses the same characters that you would see in Russian, the Cyrillic characters, um, and so it's it, it, it's pretty natural to sing actually in Russian. It's not an extremely difficult language to do. You just have to be able to know which sounds to make. Uh, Vlad Morrison who does Musica Rustica, which is a publishing company who probably publishes the version that, of the Rachmaninoff that the Houston Chamber Choir is going to be using, um, has created a, uh, trans, a, a transliteration, uh, I guess, what's the right way to call it, like a transliteration guide that he even mm -hmm. that, and he's created his own shorthand in the transliteration so you can start to uh, figure out uh, what those are. So that transliteration really, really helps. It, it, you, you just kind of are reading it using Latin phonetics mostly. Um, and so that's pretty simple. But I, I've done the Rachmaninoff. I, I believe I've done it now with 17 different professional ensembles. And about two, three years ago, shortly before COVID hit, I was doing it again. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm doing it again, I'm going to white out all of the transliteration. And so I did that for the performance and only read the Cyrillic. The problem is COVID hit. And so uh, I don't know if I can do it this time. So I'm gonna have to probably make sure I have the transliteration there again, but uh, it's kind of fun. I, I, I'll, I'll be watching TV and there'll be some Russian word and I can actually uh, sound out what the Russian word is because of all the singing I've been doing, not just in Rachmaninoff, but Grichaninoff and other folks. Uh, that I've sung in the last decade or so. I think one of the most striking things, certainly for me, about the All Night Vigil is there is a tremendous, I want to say, sense of, of mystery about the piece. Um, maybe it's a, a sense of expectation because we are, you know, coming up on uh, the, uh, it, it's the eve of, of the celebration. So we're, we're expecting, uh, we're looking forward. Um, but I find that that, that element of, of mysticism, if you like, can be found in so much of Russian Orthodox liturgical music. Well, I mean, I, I think ultimately it's at the heart of uh, Orthodox belief and thought. If you, if you, you have, you, if you look at, some of the writings of different Orthodox uh, priests and, and leaders. There's a lot of conversation about the mystery, mystery of faith or, or things like that. And, and just not needing to have an answer, but just ex living in that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, as you listen to some of those early movements, the earliest movements, are, I think, are pretty direct and straightforward. They're kind of, you know, the, the first welcoming you more or less into worship in a way. But as we as we move forward and we're and we're telling different parts of the story, um, there is this awe that's filled in there. And, and if obviously, I think some of it comes from 
the modal writing, some of it comes from the way Rachmaninoff either uses a, a pre-composed chant that, that exists from the Orthodox tradition, or in some of the movements creates his own Orthodox-like chant that he creates. And, and you know, as you start singing more and more Orthodox music, not just Rachmaninoff, you get you fall into those modes and, and understand where the music's going. And it gives you a chance to really focus on the text. And I think as much as the Orthodox tradition wants the music to be beautiful, they have a high expectation that if, if there's prose or poetry, that it is written in a way that's beautiful and honoring of God. And so there's, there's really that kind of interesting uh, battle where, where we are dealing with great texts and great music performed in this, you know, if you happen to be in an Orthodox church doing it uh, in, in a beautiful uh, setting, there's a lot of mystery. Um, I think, um, I believe it's the ninth movement, which is uh, the story of the myrrh-bearing women going to Jesus's tomb. Uh, and, and the angel says to them, well, you know, why are you here? You know, uh, he's not here anymore. I find that to be truly one of the most uh, mesmerizing movements of the way Rachmaninoff weaves in the Murberry women and has the angels singing and has all this 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 like kind of storytelling that happens within that movement. Um, it not only tells a story, but it tells it in a way that's mystical and beautiful and memorable. And, and I think maybe some folks would just kind of skip over that movement and go, it's a little bit weird. But if you spend the time to really focus on the text and see how Rachmaninoff is setting that text and how he's trying to tell the story and how he's trying to show us the mystery of resurrection uh, and the awe-filledness of that moment. Um, I think it's truly maybe the, the one of the most spectacular movements uh, in choral music uh, that, that there is. It's just, it's just a beautiful, beautiful movement. There is a piece that um, blows me away every time I hear it. Um, it's a Russian liturgical piece, and it's the English title is Behold the Bridegroom. Uh, and it's just absolutely, uh, it takes my breath away every time I hear it. Um, and I remember trying to, to find <laughs> the name of the composer, but it's anonymous. It's, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Lorena McKennett uses that chant at the beginning and end uh, of one of her pieces called uh, Dante's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And it's just absolutely spectacular as a, uh, using it to, to frame her, her song. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, uh, the way that the voices move, not just throughout the piece, but how they move in relation to each other is, uh, I think is, is the quintessential mark of, of this sort of music. I mean, you think about, you know, uh, Renaissance polyphony or medieval polyphony, or you go back to Leonine and Peronine, you know, at the beginning of the kind of medieval uh, uh, polyphonic music, it's at the heart of it is all Gregorian chant. You know, these, these long lived, chants that have been around for, uh, you know, 1500 plus years in, in some cases. Uh, you know, what we find in the Orthodox tradition is very similar types of chants. Uh, they may be started in, the, in a Byzantine style and kind of uh, migrated into Russia and those areas and were maybe changed a bit, or they may have been newly written in different traditions. I mean, you, people are still composing Byzantine chant today. Mm -hmm. uh, and still composing you know, chants that sound Russian. But there's a, there's a longevity to beautifully constructed melodies that when you can put them together in, in, uh, as the, the basis or the canis firmus, even if it's a, a modern motet or a modern setting, they work uh, because those, those melodies just have strength to them. They fit the text. They have maybe a historical context to them. And uh, I think for me, I, I really love music that uses a, a cantus firmus or a pre-existing tune 
just because I think it provides a stability to us um, and allows the composer then as they use their harmony to accentuate parts of that chant or accentuate particular phrases or texts. And I think it works quite well. And that's one of the great things about the Rachmaninoff is you hear these little melodies coming in, like in the Bogorodizia Dievo, and it just gets big and, the, and, and you know, but it's still the chant. It's still this, this chant that you would, you would be at least familiar with that experience, but it, it's interweaved into the middle and, and around the edges of, of each movement. Is there or can there be a, a, a spatial element as well? I'm thinking of, of Gabrielli writing for uh, the voices in St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. And, uh, and, and he, he had this uh, sense of, of two separate choirs interacting and playing off of each other uh, based on the, uh, the space within St. Mark's. Do we see the same sort of thing in any of the Russian composers? Well, there is there is some some uh, I, at least I've, I've experienced it in a number of different churches. It definitely happens in the Greek or the Byzantine church, where where uh, you have, maybe have a cantor on both sides of the the chancel area, and the, and they will be singing back to each other and, and forth with each other in an antiphonal way. That can happen in some church settings, uh, but something like the Rachmaninoff uh, All Night Vigil, you probably, this is just going to be one choir singing, but there are places where you might have a, a small group sing and a larger group respond, but within a worship service, you have to understand that a lot of times that also is, uh, there's a, maybe a, a third spoke to that, and that is the priests or the priest. That priest is singing all the time, and if you're uh, at a monastery like St. Tikhon's, they, you have like eight or nine priests all up uh, in, in the uh, altar area singing in harmony, and then the choir responds in harmony. I mean, it's, 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 it's chilling and exciting and fun, uh, but then again, you also never know quite what the priests are going to sing or what key they're going to sing in because, you know, they're, they can make that choice. So <laughs> you have to always respond back whatever the choir director says you're going to do. And that's always the joy of, of, of being a part of real life liturgy is you just, you just have to get yourself grounded and be ready to respond. There's so much response, so much call and response, which you don't get an experience in the all night vigil really, um, which I think is really a heart of uh, orthodoxy is, is someone's chanting something and you're, you're singing right on top of it. Um, Benedict Sheehan, who's a, a composer who writes what we probably would consider American Orthodox choral music. Uh, his, his liturgy that he wrote that, that's now this year up for a, a Grammy, um, he has all that kind of stuff built in. He has a deacon singing responded by the choir, the priest singing responded to by the choir. And you actually get that whole experience of what it really feels like to be in a worship moment. And then he has the, the big choral movements like the Rachmaninoff that, that are, you know, sparkle with virtuosity and things like that. So um, there's, there's different aspects that you don't get out of Rachmaninoff necessarily as a concert piece because he's not intending it for worship. And so you're missing some of that interaction that I think is even more cool and, and more natural in the uh, Orthodox liturgy experiences. Okay, here's the question that I'm sure you must get asked a lot. When did you discover that you're an octavist. <laughs> well, that's the funny part is I, I personally, I don't know if I would call myself an octavist because I feel like there might be only two of them in the United States uh, who, I who I would consider real octavists. Um, I always have considered myself a baritone when, when I was at St. Olaf uh, throughout m most of my uh, professional singing. I, I like really? high, I like singing low, but I, I, I have low notes. And uh, a number of years ago, Santa Fe Desert Corral, um, I had sung with them a bunch and Josh Haberman invited me to come in and sing uh, bass three in the Rachman and Off All Night Vigil. And I, I remember seeing that and I was like, what, what in the world is that? Like, I don't, I don't know if I can even sing those notes. Uh, and I, I practiced them and I was like, oh, I guess, I mean, I can make sounds down there. Um, and 
And that kind of just started everything off. I mean, the, the, the you know, I've, I've been lucky many, many, many of the times I've sung not only the Rachmaninoff, but other Orthodox related things I've been able to sing with Glenn Miller, who I would say is probably the most famous of the probably like pro choral series octavists. You also have Eric Alatore who sang with uh, Chanticleer for many, many years. Those two guys, their voices are different than everyone else's. Um, but there's a group of a group of singers like myself that are probably maybe a dozen or 15 of us who do do sing all down there. And you know, often this, I've gone many times and sung as just the, the sole uh, bass three octavist uh, for Rachmaninoff. And so those notes are there. It's just uh, it's it feels like you know if someone says, "Oh, you're like the Michael Jordan of you know," there's only one Michael Jordan, and you know it's it, that's Michael Jordan. We're we're just other people who are trying to work at it and and do the best that we can and and bring a skill forward. But uh, it's, it always scares me to say activist. I just like to say uh, a base three maybe. <laughs> or, and when you say. When you say Glenn Miller, we're not talking about the band leader. No, no. The problem is sometimes you go on Spotify and you type in Glenn Miller, you're going to get some of some of our Glenn Miller's uh, recordings <laughs> and back and forth. But no, it's 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 really a, a, an amazing experience to be able to sing these low low notes. Uh, one of the th things that's probably the most fun is when you end up you know, suddenly having to drop an octave down and, and, and you create this suddenly, you know, bass filled support for the whole choir. Um, probably the number one thing you see is the audience had all snap up, like looking around, like who's doing that sound. And that's a lot of fun. You don't, you know, you, you might have a tenor sing a beautiful high note and someone might go, Oh, that's a tenor. But when the bass is sing those low notes, you know, everyone in the room is trying to figure out where that's happening. And uh, uh, you often get a lot of conversations after a concert. Who is the low bass? Who is that? You know, so it, it's kind of fun to be able to sing those low notes and, and be a part of these amazing pieces of music. Because there's not a lot of music that is mediocre that requires uh, a bass three or a bass four or an octavist. Uh, usually by the time you're, you're doing that type of music, um it's great music and it's written by a great composer and it has legs that'll last for years and years and years to go and that's probably one of the reasons i've been able to sing this piece with you know 17 different professional ensembles is because it there's not a lot of folks who sing the super low stuff um and but people want to perform great music and so uh it's it's just one of those things you have to, you know, figure out if you're gonna, if you're going to do Wagner, you gotta have, you know, more horns. You know, you, you can't <laughs> deal with what you're dealing with in in your main ensemble. Sometimes you have to bring others in, and I, I don't see it as a cop out. I, I see it as we're we're working hard to perform music at the highest level possible, and there's certain people. Uh, like uh, I, I always think of Liam Neeson in, in, in those movies, like the Taken movies, and he says, "I have a certain set of skills, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I use them, you know. You know, you know. There's a, there's a certain set of skill I have that I've learned over the last decade, and I can use those to to help make a performance happen. Um, and it's it's a lot of fun. It, it really is. I'm, I'm really looking forward to being in Houston, especially because the weekend we're doing the all night vigil." in Houston is Pascha weekend. It's the, it's the Orthodox Easter weekend. And so uh, it, it's a perfect and fitting time to have uh, the all night vigil being performed. That's April 23rd and 24th. You went to St. Olaf College for your undergraduate degree. I did. And that is uh, an institution known for the excellence of its of its choral program, uh, but you didn't go as a singer, did you? No, I I actually went there to be a violin and viola player. I, I had actually gone to a music camp, Lutheran Summer Music, that happened in the summers, my sophomore, junior, and senior year of high school, 
and I had played uh, in the orchestra at Lutheran Summer Music with Steve Amundsen, who is the orchestra director at St. Olaf. He's actually retiring this year. Uh, and uh, it was an amazing orchestra. I mean, probably one of the best undergrad only orchestras in the United States. And uh, it was really quite a spectacular place to be in the orchestra. Um, but I still remember it was about the second week of school, I heard the St. Olaf choir sing. And it's kind of goofy to think I'm a, you know, I'm a professional singer and do professional choral music. And I had no idea who the St. Olaf choir was when I was going to. <laughs> And I heard them sing and I go, oh, what's that? That, that sounds like something I might want to do. Um, and I was really lucky, actually. I got to go on St. Olaf Choir Tour my freshman year um, as a violinist. And uh, they, they, they brought a small chamber orchestra along on that tour. And I got to experience the St. Olaf Choir Tour uh, and the St. Olaf Choir experience as uh, a freshman, which there, there are no freshmen allowed in the St. Olaf Choir. And so I was the only freshman on the whole trip and I was there as a violinist and it really hooked me. And so uh, that year I auditioned at the end of the school year and, and was lucky enough to make it into the St. Olaf Choir when I sang with them uh, for three years. Um, but, you know, kind of what we talked about is a low base. I was at, at St. Olaf, I was on the inside, middle inside of the baritone section and it would be very common for me to be told, uh, can you sing with the first tenors on this little spot? Or can you sing with the second tenors on this spot? Or can you sing with the bass twos in this spot? So I was in this little pivotal uh, part of the St. Olaf Choir where I, I needed to just move to different voice parts to help create better balance. And so I had the experience even starting at St. Olaf of having to sing low or having to sing high um, and just kind of fit into the experience of the choir. And I really enjoyed that part to be able to be very flexible. Um, and so I, that's one reason I find it fun to be able to sing the super low notes and the, the high note two and a half octaves away in the all night vigil when that happens. So range is your middle name. Yeah, it, I, I definitely have a, a pretty decent range. Uh, and it, 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 it helps a lot because I can do a lot of baritone stuff. I've even been hired once in a blue moon to sing tenor for the church choir uh, from time to time. So uh, I, it's easier to be a bass three uh, than it is to be a second tenor. I'll tell you that, at least from my voice. But uh, it's always fun to, to try a variety of different things and, and to have that flexibility. You completed your DMA, your Doctor of Musical Arts at Michigan State. Um, what was your concentration? What was your focus there? Uh, I did both a master's and a doctorate at Michigan State in choral conducting. And so uh, my, my primary focus has been to be a choir director. Uh, when I was at Michigan State, I, I never took any voice lessons. Uh, I, would, I would sing in the choirs. I would, when people had doctoral recitals, I would sing with them. But my primary focus was to become a collegiate choral director. And so that was my, my focus at the time. And what about your relationship to the operatic repertoire? Um, an octavist um, in operatic terms might be termed a, a, a basso profundo. Yeah, yeah, but there's not a lot of roles that really require super low singing. You know, you think of the commendatory or something like that in Don Giovanni. That, that would just be kind of fall into a good bass role. And that would be a role that I would love to do but the thing is you kind of have to do these bass roles in opera when you're older if you think about them they're almost always the father uh or or some old retired assassin or you know something like that uh high priest so um a lot of in a lot of ways the operatic world uh, to be a really young low bass you, you'll you'll you know you'll obviously get gigs and lots of people do but it feels more natural and fits your voice better, I think, as you get older. So um, I had never really liked opera very much. Um, my wife had, was kind of more into opera than I was, but when I was, right after I finished my doctoral work and I, I had finished my work at, at Michigan State, we were living in Arkansas. My wife was a student at University of Arkansas Fayetteville. And she said, well, 
we needed another baritone in the opera. And I had just finished my doctorate. So I was like, well, I don't have anything else to do. I've been working so hard on writing the paper and all this. So I said, all right, fine, I'll do the opera. And I got hooked. And I, I ended up, we ended up moving to New York, just outside New York City uh, shortly after that. And I did a lot of little regional operas around there. I think I sang in about 13 or 14 different operas uh, in, in New York. Uh, a couple of them were, were pro, but all of them were kind of just community based. And that, that kind of led me into one point saying, well, maybe I'll audition for a professional choir. And, and so I, it's only been about a little more than a decade that I've been actually singing um, in professional choirs, especially professional choirs where I would fly in around the country uh, and go sing with them, um, be a soloist. I was a soloist at Carnegie Hall a few times, um, most of the time as a baritone. Um, and so uh, those kind of things started happening when you're in New York and, uh, and you know, it's exciting to be able to, to do, still do this type of, type of stuff now, even on the other side of COVID and living in North Dakota, because, uh, you know, I'm coming in for the Houston Chamber Choir, but uh, back in February, I was singing with Consperari in Austin, and I was just recently in Louisville singing with another group called Artifact. So, you know, there's a lot of this that's happening uh, where you have ensembles that are brought together, or, or me as a low bass will go and sing with uh, an established group. And it's really quite exciting because you come in, you're there for just a short amount of time and, and you, you're you required to be on and make music right away. And, and that's always a lot of fun, a good challenge. You also compose. Yeah, I've, well, my father's a composer. And so I grew up in a, in a household where I had a, a father who composed. I remember, I think I was in third grade. I wrote some kind of terrible melody that was more or less just symmetrical on the, the uh, treble clef on the violin. So it was like low C, high, high, high a, <laughs> G, D, and it all was kind of symmetrical over the, the, the B. And I, I gave it to my dad and said, oh, here I wrote a melody. And a week later, he had written a sonata for me using that as the, the melody. And, you know, and I, then I went and you know, played his piece. You know, so I grew up you know, surrounded by musicians and composers. I'm a fifth generation professional musician in my family. And so the natural thing as a choir director is you, you're working with your choir and you know you want to find a piece that, is, that fits certain parameters. And obviously no one else in the history of the world has ever written it. So you got to write it yourself. <laughs> That's kind of how a lot of my composing uh, started. And I mean, I've in, in the last few years when I've done a lot of orthodox choral singing, I've actually started writing a few orthodox uh, movements, a, a cherubic hymn or a setting of the Beatitudes and things like this, which are very common, especially in the liturgy of the Orthodox Church. Um, but as we were talking earlier about you know, Canis Firmus and things, my, probably my most recent piece was when I wrote during uh, COVID, and it was a setting of uh, part of the breastplate of St. Patrick, you know, Christ, Christ in me, Christ with me, that little section of the uh, prayer. But I used a, uh, um, a chant from Hildegard as the Canis Firmus. And so the whole, it's more or less a, a modern motet that uses Hildegard's chant as the Canis Firmus and uses St. Patrick's text. And it just, it's, it's kind of an interesting piece, but I think it has a lot of strong Orthodox uh, connections to it too. So uh, yeah, I love writing music. Um, and the more I perform, the more I'm inspired to write, write new music or work with my ensembles. I would say probably one of the most important parts about my professional choral singing, when I sing with different ensembles around the country, is I always try to go into every one of those situations as a learner. Because uh, these are great ensembles, you know. What you have in Houston is a spectacular ensemble that's, that's uh, won a Grammy, you know. These, these are great ensembles. And uh, I always go into there and say, what can I learn from this experience? Uh, what can I take with me back to my college, or I, I've started my own professional choir here in North Dakota, which is the only professional choir in North Dakota. And what can I bring to them? 
Um, and so it, it really, you get out of these experiences what you put into it and what you're willing to uh, kind of humbly accept out of it. And so um, I love singing low, I love singing with great colleagues, but I, I always want to make sure that I'm taking the time to appreciate the experience of where I'm at and what I can learn from these moments. A lot of times it's what, what can I learn that I'm super excited to do at home. Every once in a while it's what are the things that I never want to see myself ever do again because it didn't work that week when I was watching this conductor or that conductor uh, do rehearsals or performing things like that. So that's the fun part for me is I actually, I really feel like I go in uh, and I come out uh, a better musician, a better singer because I've been surrounded by great colleagues, but I've also kind of accepted um, the expertise of those around me uh, as, as something I can learn from. And you mentioned uh, Hildegard, you're talking about Hildegard of Bingen, 12th century? Yeah. Uh, 12th or 13th? 12th century, yeah. I actually was at, at the uh, monastery that uh, in Bingen, uh, the ruined monastery in, in Germany a, a number of years ago, and it was just amazing to walk around there and just think, I mean, Hildegard's the greatest feminist uh, church leader probably in the history of the church. And she a thousand years ago almost. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing to think what, who she was and, and the, the uh, not only the power of her as an individual, but as a mystic, as a poet, as a composer. I mean, she was the true Renaissance woman uh, in doing everything and uh, truly remarkable. So I, I, I love Hildegard. Anytime I can hear the music, or just experience, you know, something that you find in a writing. Uh, I would put her on near the top of my list of people in the history of the world that I I would have loved to be able to sit down and have a, a dinner with. Uh, just amazing, amazing woman. Well, you never know, maybe in a thousand years, somebody will be using a Jason Poems chant right. as as a as a cantus firmus for for their own uh, composition well that, that would be fun that would be fun and you get the royalties <laughs> that's right an extra jewel in the crown when i get to the holy land you know so <laughs> jason it's been fascinating to talk to you and uh we look forward to rachmaninoff's all night vigil yourself with the houston chamber choir conducted of course by robert simpson which will take place uh, April 23rd and 24th at uh, Rice University. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us and yeah. uh, all good wishes. Well, thanks very much. And I look forward to meeting you in Houston when I'm there. And thank you to everybody who supports the Houston Chamber Choir. Join us again next time for Behind the Music. I'm Sinjin Flynn. Thank you. Thank you to all who support the Houston Chamber Choir. Our season underwriter, Silvercrest Asset Management Group, our patrons, donors, and subscribers. We appreciate all you do to help keep the work of the Houston Chamber Choir possible. I'm Sinjin Flynn, and this is Behind the Music. Join us again next time. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue to create new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org give.